For hundreds of great shows like this one, go to onnetworks.com. Play Value is brought to you by Xbox Live Marketplace. In 1989, Nintendo owns the video game market. They're operating, for all intents and purposes, as a monopoly. Atari tried to take them down, but was completely unsuccessful. Not even close. Uh, the, really, the first bump in the road for them is Sega and the Genesis. Up through the 80s, really, you know, Nintendo had, was dominating the video game market, killing Sega's master system, basically installing themselves in almost every kid's home in America. Sega needed to combat that. What does Sega do? They put all their money into R&D. They developed the Genesis, a fantastic new console. They put the Genesis out there, and then just like a political campaign, step one, flood the market with negative advertisements, try to knock Nintendo down a notch or two in the public eye. Came out with this crazy marketing campaign in which they're like, Sega does what Nintendo don't. I mean, Sega was so aggressive when the Genesis came out. Step two, grow the market. If Nintendo has a lock on the 10 year olds, well then go after the older brothers, go after the high school seniors, and then if they like Sega, and think that is cool, their younger brothers will eventually uh, come along and go, oh, I want to play the cool system too, just like my big brother. You know, in Sega's advertising, they're like, well, you know what? Nintendo's for little kids. We are for you. We are for the teenagers. We are for, you know, we're a little bit more edgy. We're cool. That's baby stuff. Now, how is Sega going to get their hands on these older kids? Well, they released a lot of sports games. That's always popular with high school and college kids. And then they signed up a lot of celebrities. They had Arnold Palmer Golf. They had Pat Riley's Basketball. They had Michael Jackson's Moonwalker. Sega went out there and got a lot of endorsements, a lot of celebrities. And that's something Nintendo had really avoided. Nintendo made a celebrity. They had Mario. They had Zelda. Those were their celebrities. Sega didn't have anything like that, so they had to go out and get people like Madden, Buster Douglas Boxing, uh, Joe Montana Sports Talk Football. Granted, the games may or may not have been great, but they used names that this older group of people would recognize. And they also brought back all the arcade classics like Golden Axe and Shinobi. A little 10-year-old's not going to know what these are, but if you're in high school or college, you're going to remember these and maybe you want them for your home system. Basically, Sega had a history of making really good arcade games. For the first time, you could play arcade-like versions of Strider, Altered Beast, Space Harrier. Sega also produced games that were more intellectually stimulating, you should say, like games that are geared toward older kids. Uh, Sword of Vermilion is a, is a good example. These are complex role-playing games. More complex adult games like Fantasy Star or Populous, which to this day I can't figure out. And then Sega also had wackier, more indie fare, like they had a Ren and Stimpy game, they had Toe Jam and Earl, that kind of appealed to that artsy, cool crowd. Same with Echo the Dolphin. It's a very original game that's not like anything out there, and there may be a reason for that, but you gotta hand it to them, it's unique. Now everything's going well for Sega, but they're missing one thing. Nintendo, well they've got mascots, they've got Mario, they've got Zelda, they've got Donkey Kong, they have all these great characters. Nintendo has this cast of characters that have worked their way into people's hearts. And, you know, whenever you think of Nintendo, I instantly think of Mario. The Sega doesn't have this yet. So they have a big board meeting and they go, what can we do? What kind of character can we come up with? And amazingly, they actually came up with something cool. They came up with Sonic the Hedgehog. It was fast. It was furious. It was kind of out there. It was a little edgy. It had spiky hair. He had attitude. It was everything that was Sega. And it was huge. It was a reason to buy the system and a reason to buy a new system before the Super Nintendo came out. It's one of the great games. It's, it's, it's canon. Sonic's part of the canon. Sonic came on the scene, kick And then the problems begin again because Nintendo releases the Super Nintendo. And now the battle has to start all over again. Super Nintendo comes out, so technology-wise they're even. Now it comes down to the games, and now it's a real slugfest, just going back and forth. Nintendo has ads like, uh, Nintendo is what Genesis isn't. And uh, Genesis fights back by starting a price war and everyone starts cutting the cost of their consoles, making them cheaper for gamers. Nintendo landed Final Fight, which was one of the biggest arcade hits, and Sega couldn't get that, so they made Streets of Rage, which is a pretty good competitor, uh, in a lot of ways superior. Sega doesn't have Final Fantasy, so they made Fantasy Star. Now you can go back and forth on which system was actually better or more powerful, but the fact is, the Genesis actually had more fun games come out more often. Nintendo has a lot of big franchises, and they drop one, maybe two a year. These are classic games like Super Metroid or Mario World 2. And of course, 
I haven't even thought of it yet, but Mario Kart. Nintendo's strategy is, we're gonna sit around and wait for the next Mario title, the next Zelda title to come around, and then we'll release it. Sega developed a think tank for games, basically, the Game Institute, and they came up with all kinds of new games and new IPs, and they just kept throwing them out there, and they were all really good. So if you wanted to play more good games, well, you had to get yourself a Genesis. Sega was basically hammering you with Bs when Nintendo was waiting, and once a year, they'd drop an A+. It just keeps going on and on, and by the time the smoke clears, Sega actually has an edge in the marketplace, owning about 65% of the console market. Sega got a toehold in the market with technology, and that's what they figure is gonna win this game. Uh, and this is just the classic mistake you see hardware manufacturers making over and over again, worrying about the console and not about the games. They had the lead, and all they had to do was nothing to maintain it. But instead, they did everything and destroyed themselves. They released the Sega CD, and there is nothing even resembling a reason to buy the Sega CD. Every game on it is uh, terrible. Then there's the 32X, which, I mean, I, no one can name a 32X game. You know, I, no, I don't even know anyone that's ever seen a 32X. I'm skeptical they exist. One system is CDs. This is the future. The next system? Eh, we're back to cartridges. <laughs> the next system? Oh, we're back to CDs again! Sega looked like a company who had no idea where they were going, no idea how they got there, and no idea what to do right now. What's Nintendo doing in the meantime? Nothing. Selling games, selling consoles, counting money, waiting for Sega to burn itself out. Nintendo just sat on the Super Nintendo, said this is it, and focused on making great games for that for five years. They didn't even release a 32-bit system. They went from 16 to 64-bit. So Sega's telling everyone their systems have the latest technology, and it's so important to have the latest technology, and then Nintendo comes out with Donkey Kong Country, a 16-bit game which looks and plays so much better than anything Sega's put out. It made Sega look silly. Why spend all this money on add-ons when the greatest, most advanced games are on the old system? Sega died as a hardware company. The Dreamcast was its last gasp with all that. I mean, Sega pulled back, got out of the hardware business, just started making software. And the first time you booted up your Nintendo and saw Sonic's face, you knew it was over. When Sonic's face appeared on a Nintendo machine, Game over, man. Game over. And it's like, I never think we'd see this, but later in 2007, we're getting a Sonic Mario joint title. Which is a Mario and Sonic Olympics game. You know, it's always been Sega versus Nintendo, Nintendo versus Sega, and now kind of that competition is fully realized in this game where it's Sonic versus Mario. Who's the better Olympian? We shall see. It's hard to imagine with all this bad blood between Nintendo and Sega, they were able to sit down in a room together and hammer out this deal. I mean, it was 10 years ago, which isn't that long, but in software, that's an eternity. And uh, it's just ancient history now. Rated E10 plus the T. Play the games everyone wants to play. For hundreds of great shows like this one, go to onnetworks.com.